Last Sunday, the first of Lent, we were invited to draw nearer to God through prayers and to the poor through fasting and almsgiving. On this second Sunday of Lent, the readings call us to contemplate the goodness of God with Abram, who in the first reading receives the promise of descendants, too numerous to count, and with the apostles Peter, James, and John, who in the gospel behold the glory of Jesus in the company of Moses and Elijah, two other great figures of the Judeo-Christian tradition, who are themselves marked by their privileged experience of the manifestation of divine presence and glory, which theologians call theophany. While enjoying these rosy experiences of divine goodness and divine glory, we are also cautioned not to get stuck there. The second reading points out the fact that working with God also involves embracing the way of the cross and moments of trial which we must not run away from as the unfolding of the stories of both Abraham and the apostles will eventually show us. Genesis 15 which we have as our first reading is the account of the promise God made to bless Abraham and make him great and because Abraham thought his childlessness as a barrier to any future greatness, God assured to give him an offspring and to give to his descendants a land of their own. The gift of the land, however, was to be preceded by 400 years of slavery and landlessness. Abraham believed the Lord, who counted that for him as righteousness. The term used for Abraham's believing is Aman, which in the Hebrew Bible has the sense of trusting profoundly in a person. Abraham's trust was indeed profound because it was trust in the fact that from childlessness he will be the father of a great nation constituted by a multitude as numerous as the stars of the sky. It was profound because his wife was barren and both of them were of advanced age, yet he trusted. It was profound trust because the gift of the land to his descendants was not to be fulfilled in a year or ten. But after 400 years, long after Abraham, therefore his kind of trust amounted to righteousness, Zedekah. Note that here righteousness is not equated with moral perfection. In fact, the story of Abraham will reveal a series of moral inadequacies. But his profound trust that the promise made to him by the Lord will be fulfilled is counted as righteousness. As we continue our journey of conversion during this Lent, let us pray for the grace of profound trust in the Lord, knowing that no matter how impossible it seems and no matter how long it takes, the Lord is able to do it for us. For with God, nothing is impossible. In chapter 3 of his letter to the Philippians, Paul warns the community against false teachers. He tells them to beware of the dogs, evildoers, and those who mutilate the flesh. All these were referencing those who thought that Christians must adhere to Jewish practices, especially that of circumcision. Although a circumcised Jew himself, a Pharisee who knew and practiced the law, Paul tells the Philippians that he has now found righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. Read Philippians chapter 3, 3 to 9. In our reading, Paul tells the Philippians to imitate him and fix their eyes on his fellow gospel workers. Paul makes an important distinction between himself and his fellow workers and the enemies of the cross of Christ. The Philippians must avoid the enemies of the gospel for four reasons. The first is that their end is destruction. The destruction here, apoleia in Greek, refers to eternal destruction or judgment. Read Matthew chapter 7 verse 13, Philippians chapter 1 verse 28, and 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 7. Secondly, their God is their belly. It means 
that they are only preaching the gospel because of the reward they get. Thirdly, they take pleasure in shameful behavior, shameful practices. And finally, they set their minds on earthly things. In contrast, believers have citizenship in heaven with Jesus Christ as their Savior. The word Paul uses here is politeuma, which can be translated as citizenship, state, or commonwealth. Paul in this statement is contrasting the highly prized Roman citizenship with God's kingdom. People longed to have Roman citizenship, and probably many of these Philippians also desired that. They wanted to be Roman citizens. But Paul challenges them to look beyond the earthly city of Rome, where the Roman emperor was seen as a savior, to the heavenly city where the true savior is Jesus Christ. The earthly city will fade away. This earth will pass away. But the heavenly city will give us a new status. Jesus Christ will transform our bodies like his glorious body. Looking ahead at the benefits as citizens of heaven, Paul encourages the Philippians to stand firm in the Lord. The lengthy season reminds us of our true home in heaven, where we shall experience the goodness of God and the glory of Jesus Christ. The Gospel reading from Luke chapter 9 from verse 28 to 36 is about the transfiguration event that gives a foretaste of Jesus' future glory. Although today is not the Feast of the Transfiguration, the readings, however, present us with the story of the Transfiguration to remind us of Jesus' mission and our invitation through the eyes of the Apostles into a glimpse of God's kingdom, the essence of our Lenten observance. This event comes after Peter declares Jesus as the Messiah of God, and Jesus predicts his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. See Luke chapter 9 from verses 18 to 27. So Jesus goes to the mountain with three of his close apostles, Peter, James, and John, and there he was transfigured. Moses and Elijah, who also had encountered God on the mountain, appeared and discussed with him. Their discussion was about his departure, in Greek, Exodus, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. The new exodus of Jesus echoes Moses' exodus of the children of Israel in the Old Testament. While the old exodus begins from Egypt and ends in Jerusalem, Jesus' exodus begins from Jerusalem and leads to God's promised kingdom in heaven. Jesus' exodus here, which will take place in Jerusalem, is his departure, suffering, and death and resurrection, the paschal mystery that ushers in our salvation. Moses and Elijah are the two significant figures who experienced God's glory on Mount Sinai and Horeb in Exodus chapter 24 and in 1 Kings chapter 19. As Moses' face shone brightly after meeting God in Exodus 34, so did Jesus' face and cloth shine brightly in Luke chapter 9. Likewise, as Elijah was taken up alive from the earth in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11, so will Jesus ascend into heaven after his resurrection from the dead. Hence, while Moses looks back to the Exodus, Elijah looks forward to fulfilling their scatological promises. Jesus therefore comes to establish the new covenant and effect the new exodus that would lead to salvation in God's kingdom. Moreover, although they were weighed down with sleep, staying awake, the disciples saw Christ's glory and the two men with him and requested to build tents there, away from the troubles of the world. A reminder that in praying with Jesus, we witness God's overwhelming glory around us. And then they heard the voice of God declaring, This is my Son, my chosen, listen to him. God speaks to us, especially during this Lenten season, revealing his Son and maintaining that against all natural inclinations, we must listen to Jesus who insists on suffering as the way to glory and calls us to carry our crosses daily and follow him. 
Therefore, like the apostles, we must go down the mountain with Jesus, continue with our observances, carry our crosses, and remain hopeful and strengthened in the faith as we await the promised glory of God for us in salvation. May God grant you a blessed week ahead. The Devar Adonai team thanks you for listening and may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. To follow our reflections for Sundays and solemnities, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow our Facebook page, Devar Adonai, or visit our website, devaradonai.org.